Yeah. 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 Yeah, I didn't notice that uh, as a result of this, yeah. this paper, he threw out all mixed models. Yeah. yeah. Except for those four instances where, you know, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I think you could say you need the right tool for the job. Right. Uh, I did notice that Analyze is really old because uh, they had to throw out some of the data in order to make the sample size equal on each Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's what people used to do because they were using uh, yeah. uh, formulas to allow you to analyze data in which there were, in which there were um, yeah, varying sample sizes. Yeah. 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 Advice. Usually, they 
bring out their data and they fitted some complicated um, model and they want to know whether they've done it correctly or they can't figure out how to model and fix the random effects. So usually I tell them to first do a test on the summary statistics like Murtaugh suggests. And if you get a different answer, you did your first one wrong. <laughs> they really, they should agree more or less, and if they don't, you should know exactly why. So, so there's something to be said for the complicated analysis, or something to be said for the simple analysis. In Murtaugh's first example, his simple analysis in which he just does a t-test on the pond means, the reason he gets the same answer as in his mixed effects model is because the mixed effects model in the test of treatment effects pairs the pond means. Actually right, has, yeah. It actually does yeah. the simple test out. as the test, and that's often the case. Mm -hmm. and so, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to weigh in on whether you should do it the more complicated. If you want variance components, you've got to model all of the data. Okay, so uh, one of the one of the things that happened uh, with my relatives over Thanksgiving weekend is that we shared viruses. <laughs> hopefully, I'll, hopefully I'll last. <laughs> Three or five kilo over just tipped out of here. There's no lights on. Let me, let me rest. <laughs> so I want to talk about likelihood uh, today. It's a, it's a major topic in analysis of data. It's the basis of a lot of the methods we already use, and it's certainly the basis of the method we're going to learn next week, generalized linear models. And so uh, now seems a good time to discuss it. So I want to start by first making clear what probability is, and uh, this is the definition that we generally use when we when we use conventional statistics. It's a um, it's the I, the idea is that even though you've got your data, you you go back to the population and collect more data, you get a different data set and a different sample mean and, and so on. The idea of probability is that it represents the outcomes in the long run. If you repeat a random trial, such as take a random sample, over and over again under the same conditions, then um, a fraction of times you see a particular outcome represents the probability of that outcome. And then a probability distribution, such as the normal distribution, is a list of all the mutually exclusive outcomes that you might get. And then their probabilities of occurrence or probability density. So now that that's clear, um, I want to give an example, and one that I'll use later when I explain likelihood, and this is the binomial distribution. It's one of the easiest distributions to understand, and we use it all the time when we um, carry out um, analyses of data that are, you know, fractions of individuals belonging to different categories. So a binomial distribution applies when uh, we're counting the number of successes in n independent random trials or an independent trial, when the probability of success is the same in each trial. So the trials are independent, probability is the same in each trial. If that's true, then the probability of getting y successes in n independent trials is this formula here. And that's known as the binomial distribution. And I've illustrated it for the case where the probability of success in a given trial is 0.5, flip a coin. And uh, in this example, we have 18 trials. And that's really, you know, the, um, the probability of success times the number of successes, the probability of failure times the number of failures. And then this term here represents the number of ways in which you can get successes and failures. So, for example, if you, if you toss a coin three times and success is a heads, there's three different ways that you could get two heads and one tail. Success, success, failure, success, failure, success, failure, success, success. So this n choose y is a way of counting up all of those possibilities. And that's how you plug in um, counts and, and, uh, and estimate or generate probabilities for the binomial distribution. And uh, it's a probability distribution. This indicates the probability of getting exactly three successes in 18 trials when the probability is and so on. So it tells you the probability of all the outcomes. Um, now I want to talk about something called conditional probability, which is a little bit more of a brain twister. But uh, a conditional probability is the probability of a particular outcome, but depending on uh, a given condition being met. And uh, a vertical bar is often used to illustrate this in, in sort of 
statements, uh, statements of uh, conditional probability. So we can describe uh, the probability that if you have two kids, then the first child is a girl, what's the probability that the second child is a girl? So that's described as a conditional probability. It's not a very interesting one in this case because we know that the probability or the, the event your first child is a girl has really no influence on the probability of a boy or a girl and the second child. So that's an uninteresting conditional probability. But there are other conditional probabilities and, and the literature is full of such statements. So what's the probability we'll, we'll see an elephant today? <clears throat> well, if I tell you, given that we are in the Serengeti, your answer would be different than if I said, we are in Manhattan. <laughs> and uh, so probability statements about successes and failures in random trials are formulated kind of the same way. It's possible to say, what's the probability of getting 12 successes in however many trials, given that the probability of success in any one trial is not five? Or what is it if the probability of success is only 0.1? Those are statements that we can make, and as you'll see, this is exactly how likelihoods are constructed. Okay, so what is likelihood? Likelihood is a conditional probability. So the likelihood, and, and we talk about likelihoods not of data, we talk about likelihoods of parameters that we're interested in estimating, or hypotheses we're interested in uh, comparing. So in the case of a population parameter, a fraction of successes in the population, the likelihood of the population parameter equaling a specific value, given the data, is the probability of obtaining the data, given that the population parameter equals the specific value. So it takes uh, a probability, a conditional probability, and kind of inverts it. And the way likelihood works is that we ask ourselves, um, you know, what's the likelihood of the parameter being 0.1, or 0.2, or 0.3, given the data set that we have? And that's calculated as the probability of getting the data given that the parameter equals 0.1, or 0.2, or 0.3. Okay. And um, <clears throat> the law of likelihood says that the extent to which data supports one parameter value or hypothesis against another is equal to the ratio of their likelihood or the difference in their log likelihoods, and all of, all of uh, likelihood inferences based on that principle. And if you're ever feeling particularly chuffed because your paper just got accepted or you just got some award, just remember that R.A. Fisher invented this principle when he was a third year undergraduate. <laughs> if you need some humbling, just think about, it, about Fisher. So likelihoods used a lot in various areas. I'll show you an example later. It's used a lot in genetic mapping studies. One of the first areas where we started to hear about it a lot was in phylogeny estimation. And uh, one application of this was basically the final re resolution of, I mean, you may not know this, but at one time this was controversial. What exactly is the sister group to our own species? Forgetting Neanderthal. <coughs> is it the gorilla? Is it the trio of gorilla, you know, the two chimps, uh, or are we sister group to the, to the chimpanzees? And one of the reasons why this was so controversial is because we didn't have very much genetic data. And, uh, so it was hard to convince you that one was more highly supported than the other. But how the, the controversy was um, eventually solved is by a comparison of the likelihoods of each of these three um, uh, alternatives in a paper by Ranel and Yang, and there were other papers at the time, more or less doing the same approach. And so they had a probability model for molecular changes through time, and that allowed them to calculate the probability of getting this, um, um, getting the genetic data which they had for all of these taxa, and their differences among them, if this was the correct tree or if this was the correct tree, or if this was the correct tree. And those represent then the likelihoods of each tree. The likelihood of tree I given the data, which in this case was gene sequence data. And uh, that likelihood again is the probability of obtaining the gene sequence data given each of the trees. And again, the, the probability of getting the genetic data given um, either of these three trees is a very small number. <laughs> 
But what matters is not the absolute likelihoods. There being so many possible outcomes for the data, none of them has any, you know, any one of those, any one of them has a pretty negligible outcome of ever occurring if you were to repeat the process of evolution all over again. But what matters is the, um, the relative magnitudes. So I've written them as exponents here because those numbers up at the top are the log likelihoods. And they are considered substantially different. And this one is considered substantially better than the other two, and that kind of resolved it. So I'm going to give a, an example, a relatively easy example, because uh, you know I want you to be able to sort of appreciate the mechanics of going from an idea like likelihood to um, a useful result like uh, the probability of success or the fraction of successes in a population. So here's a data set that, um, that I found. This is a, a photograph of the head of a cabbage white butterfly. And here's a little uh, wasp sitting on the butterfly and uh, waiting for the butterfly to land somewhere and lay eggs. And then the, fly, the wasp climbs down and parasitizes those eggs. <clears throat> and uh, this study was carried out to determine whether the wasps can distinguish mated female butterflies from unmated females. The idea being that why ride around on an unmated female? Or a wasp. So they're interested in can they actually distinguish a cabbage butterfly that has made it or has not made it. And um, so they carried out a series of 32 independent trials. Basically your typical Y tube kind of trial where you have a mated and an unmated cabbage white butterfly and a single wasp and the wasp has to sort of orient in one direction or the other. And we'll call it a success if the wasp orients towards the mated female and a failure if she orients towards the unmated female. And the result of this, so every trial is independent. They use two different butterflies each trial and you know, randomize their locations and a different wasp each time. So they conform to the assumptions of the binomial distribution. And independent trials, the probability of success in any one trial is the same. 23 of 32 wasps chose the mated female. And the question is, uh, what can we say using that number? Uh, what is our estimate of the proportion of wasps in the population that can actually distinguish in such a trial the mated from the unmated female? Okay, so that's what we're going to try and estimate here. At this point, we're just trying to estimate something. P in the population, the fraction of moths that would choose the mated female in a trial just like this. So, 23 out of 32 successes. And to solve this, we're going to use the likelihood method. So again, those are the data, y is 23. And what we want to know is the likelihood of alternative values for p, uh, given the data that uh, y wasps chose the mated female. <coughs> and that likelihood is calculated as the probability that, of the data that 23 were chosen, uh, given p. So that's how we sort of phrase the likelihood, the likelihood of p given 23. And that's just the binomial probability same formula I showed you before with 32, so, oops, that's upside down, 23 choose 32 is what it should be, and then number of successes, p to the number of successes, 1 minus p to the number of failures. So for example, the likelihood of, the likelihood that p is 0.5, that it's just a coin toss, <clears throat> is calculated using the formula as shown, and it's 0 0.00653. And in R, that's all you would have to do to get it to calculate for you using the density of the binomial function. Okay, so that's the probability of the data given that P is 0.5. But the question is, what is P in the population? That's what we want to try to estimate. And the way this is done using the likelihood approach is that you repeat this calculation for all P's that are possible. And uh, so what I've done is I've sort of grinded through, rounding off to the nearest couple of decimal points and uh, calculated the likelihood each time and produced what's called the likelihood function. And uh, it's generally easier to, to take the log of the likelihood so that the numbers are more uh, manageable. <coughs> and what you're looking for is, uh, for, for the maximum likelihood estimate is the number that corresponds to the peak in this function. And that's the same whether you're using likelihood or the log of likelihood. Okay, the maximum is the same. <clears throat> so I did the likelihood of 0.5 given, 20, given the data. It's the, um, the uh, likelihood function. <clears throat> it's the binomial function. 
as shown before, there's the log likelihood corresponding to, um, at, to the value 0.5. There's the R formula that you would use if you were going to use the computer. And uh, that is, yeah, there's 0.5, there's minus, minus 5.03125. And so you repeat this for a whole slew of values, and there's the likelihood, likelihood function, log likelihood curve. And uh, the basic idea is really to work backwards from um, the way we normally think about things, because what we're what we're doing when we're employing maximum likelihood is we're treating the population proportion as the variable, and the data as what we have. There's only one data set, and now what we're varying is actually p. p is a constant in this population. We just don't know it, and so we vary p, and then look at the log likelihood each time. But I want to point out that uh, the log likelihood curve is not a probability distribution because uh, under this framework the variable population proportion is not a random variable. It's not like we randomly sample p from some population. <clears throat> um, but rather we're just we're just treating it as the variable and the data as a constant, generating the likelihood function, the likelihood curve, and then using that to try to uh, estimate things that we're interested in. So the maximum likelihood estimate is the parameter value having the highest likelihood and highest log likelihood given the data. And uh, in this case, that's 0.72. So that's how I found it in R. I just sort of ground through all of the possible values, and uh, we're going to do this in the workshop this week. And so this value, 0.72, is uh, described as the maximum likelihood estimate, or MLE. And uh, it's considered the parameter value most strongly supported by the data, and that's why it is our point estimate. And now you say, well, I could have done this a lot more quickly, even just on a piece of paper, by calculating the estimated proportion as 23 divided by 32 equals 0.72. <laughs> you already knew that, but you were polite and didn't say that, uh, hey, hey, there's actually a easier way to do this. <clears throat> but I wanted to grind through this example just to show you that we arrived at something which is fairly intuitive. Um, also, to, to tell you that one of the reasons why we use y over n as our method to calculate the best estimate of the proportion is because it is the maximum likelihood estimate of the proportion. So that's one of the reasons why it, it works for us. And in fact, most of the formulas that you use to calculate means, regression slopes, and so on, uh, are yield maximum likelihood estimates. And so that's one of the reasons why we use those methods. Because maximum likelihood is considered something that is a desirable feature of an estimate. The likelihood curve gives us some additional information as well that we can use. And that is an approximate confidence interval, 95% confidence interval. So here's my log likelihood curve. And uh, what I've done is here's the dashed line that uh, runs through the, the peak. And then what I've done is I've taken another line and dropped it uh, minus uh, 1.92 units from the, um, from the peak. And then drawn a line here, and drawn a line here. And uh, those correspond to the values 0.55 and 0.86. And uh, my claim is that 0.55 to 0.86 represents an approximate 95% um, confidence interval for the um, population parameter P. So I would write this as my 95% confidence interval if I was analyzing these data in a, in a paper. And this method actually provides some of the, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to estimate uh, confidence intervals for proportions, but this is one of the best. Now, wh where does magic 1.92 actually <laughs> come from? It seems pretty random. Well, it's not random. It's one half the uh, chi-square uh, statistic associated with the uh, uh, 
an area under the curve of 0.05 and a single degree of freedom. And uh, uh, the connection will become clear a little later on in the lecture. Okay, so uh, you can do this. <clears throat> I can do this. I did this. And, uh, and then you think, well, that was not very satisfying because we already have methods to calculate confidence intervals for, to estimate proportions and to estimate, calculate confidence intervals for proportions. And so I thought, well, <clears throat> the beauty of likelihood and at least knowing how you get from data to a likelihood as in the previous example is because the approach can be used in situations where there is no mathematical formula for you to calculate things that are um, of interest. And so I thought I would show you an example. <clears throat> and that is that I would uh, get some data from a phylogeny, in this case uh, the Hawaiian silver sword. So this is a, just this outrageous group of plants that radiated on the Hawaiian archipelago. And um, they're you know, like closely related to daisies, but they have all kinds of uh, strange and wonderful phenotypes in Hawaii. And um, that I would try to use the uh, data that exists from the molecular phylogeny to estimate speciation and extinction rates in, throughout the history of this uh, group. And uh, what I want to show you is that you can do this without being a mathematician. All you need to know is how to, um, all you need to do is find a formula for the probability distribution of data as a function of the parameters you're interested in, speciation and extinction. And then you just sort of grind through all of the possibilities and find the maximum, just as I did for the, um, the proportion case that I, I showed you. So one of the reasons why I was interested in doing this is because I'm interested in speciation rates and how they affect the numbers of species that are present. And we've done work on this in my lab, for example, we were interested, there's a lot of ideas out there about why there are more species in the tropics than in the temperate zone. And one of the ideas that still has a lot of traction out there is that speciation rates are higher in the tropics than they are in the temperate zone. And so what we've done in my lab is try to estimate speciation rates um, in, uh, in, in birds and mammals or uh, groups at different latitudes, and what we found was the opposite, that speciation rates are actually higher in Canada than in Brazil. That generally, latitudinal gradients in speciation rate are flat, or they're, they're tilted to be higher in the temperate zone than in the tropics, which was a surprise. So it's fun to do this kind of stuff. So here's how uh, I, I did it. This is a small data set, and it makes it a little easier to just show you how it works and some of the assumptions. But we assume that a tree represents something called a branching process. And it's a well-described process in, in the probability books. And uh, the, the branching process is described by two parameters that we're interested in. One is the, the instantaneous probability that at any interval of time a split occurs. We'll call that speciation. And uh, the instantaneous probability at any time that a lineage will just simply die and, and go extinct. And those are lineages that don't make it to the present. <clears throat> so the trick with this method is to describe the probability of all possible outcomes in terms of a group of species when you only have the survivors and not the ones that actually went extinct. And the data that are used in this case, I'll show you, are the times between branching events as you go from left to right. <clears throat> And the procedure is the same as, uh, uh, as I just showed you for the binomial distribution. It's really, there's nothing particularly nuanced um, about it. There's two parameters instead of one, but the basic idea is the same. So I found a formula that described the distribution of waiting times between speciation events um, and how that depends on the, the speciation rate and the extinction rate. And so I plug this into R and uh, use that to calculate the likelihoods for a range of possible values of speciation and extinction, just like I did earlier a range of possible values for the population proportion. Then I made a contour plot, just like I showed you for the likelihood function in two dimensions, I had made a contour plot because there's the two parameters. 
And I use that to get an idea of the uncertainty of that estimate. By the way, that's a, I want to remind you that that's an approximation, and there are ways to improve the accuracy that I did not do. Um, <clears throat> so the way that uh, Sean Nee um, sort of figured out how to get information about speciation and extinction from phylogenetic trees of just the survivors is through this thing that he called the lineages, lineages through time plot, where you start at the earliest split in the tree, and you go to the present time, and then you just accumulate up the total number of lineages from the past to the present. <clears throat> and if there has been no extinction whatsoever, that should be represented on average by a straight line from the past to the present. Species just accumulate exponentially. But if there is uh, extinction as well as speciation, then for most of the duration of, the, of time, the, um, the rate of accumulation of species is determined by the difference between speciation and extinction, which is kind of intuitive. But there's more information at the tip about speciation alone, and that's because speciation has to happen before extinction can occur. So there's a bit of a pileup in the recent past, and so information has to be gathered there in order to estimate both speciation and extinction. Anyway, here's the data for the Hawaiian silver swords. <clears throat> so, starting with the earliest split, using that molecular phylogeny, every, each dot corresponds to another split in the tree going from left to right, and it's not a completely straight line, it has a bit of curvature toward the present. Now all I had to do was plug a formula into R, and it looks like this. And you just think, oh my god, I could never do that. But my point is, you don't have to. You can plug this into R. If I can do it, you can do it. As long as you understand that this is the probability distribution for T, the waiting time between species events, then you can do exactly what I did here. And the reason I show you this example is because, well, uh, it was interesting to me. I did it. And, um, and because there's no formula to calculate these things, you have to use an approach like this to estimate. Did he come up with that? Sean came up with that along with a couple of others. He had help from Bob May. So anyway, that was the that was the equation and that's all those things. An important assumption of this method is that the speciation and extinction rates have not changed through the history of this lineage. And it's the same along all branches. Everybody knows that assumption is false. <laughs> but uh, you know. <clears> there <throat> might nevertheless be some ways in which you can use that data anyway. So what I did was, oh yeah, so if you look at the formula, the speciation and extinction appears either as the difference between the two, which is sort of net diversification, or as the ratio of extinction to speciation. So I just rewrote the equation and called the difference A and the ratio R. And then what I did is I went through all possible values for A, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Obviously, I did a finer distinction as well. And all possible values from R, uh, for R here, and calculated the log likelihood every time using this formula. So it was just sort of brute force search. And uh, then I displayed the results in a... Um, contour plot. So now the height of this curve coming out of the page is the log likelihood. So this is now in 3D. It's a, it's a surface rather than just a, a function like uh, in, the, in the proportion case. And that's just because I have two parameters. One is the difference between speciation and extinction and the other is the ratio of the two. And there's my maximum likelihood estimate for A and for R. And from that I can get the maximum likelihood estimates for lambda. And so it's pretty straightforward. You could do this. I did it. And the other reason, or the other reason it was useful to me to do this analysis is when I looked at this contour plot, I thought, hmm, you know, it, it changes rapidly in this direction, but it doesn't change so fast in that direction. And that sort of becomes clear when you look at the sort of the 95% the confidence region for the speciation, or for the, the difference and the ratio. And again, it doesn't change much this way, but changes this way. And, and what that means is that even with relatively few species on this Hawaiian silver swords, I can get a reasonably good sort of interval estimate of the difference between speciation and extinction. 
which determines how fast we should accumulate for most of their history. But I know almost nothing about the relative magnitudes of extinction and speciation, and that's pretty common also. So generally, it's easy to estimate the difference between speciation and extinction, but it's hard to estimate each of them individually with the kind of data sets. Okay. So that was just an example where I worked through the same procedure as I did for the proportion and showed you how exactly the same brute force procedure could be used in a fairly complicated case, which, well, the formula seemed complicated, but the results were reasonably intuitive. And anybody could do this. <clears throat> Armed with R, you can, you too can estimate stuff provided. <laughs> But if you know what the probability distribution is. And uh, we're going to do that in the workshop on Thursday. So one of the things that you're going to estimate is a proportion. And I hope you get through that example. Because the next thing is going to be more fun. We're going to estimate elephant numbers in Africa. How fun is that? <laughs> and we're going to just use basically the simplest possible capture, recapture method, which is likely based and uh, we're going to use it to, to show you how you can estimate population size in that, um, <coughs> using a known probability distribution for the outcomes. Okay, I wanted to show you one other trick from, log, from, from likelihood, and that is the log-likelihood ratio test. So the log-likelihood ratio test is a method based on the likelihood that allows you to compare the fits of two models to data. And the models, for this method to work, the models must be nested. And I don't mean that in the sense of, you know, nested ANOVA or anything like that. I, I used the term nested uh, earlier when I referred to the concept of a reduced model and a full model. So in the analysis, uh, the linear models um, section of the course we talked about, um, ANOVA tables and how each term in a, uh, a, in a linear model is tested in an ANOVA table <coughs> each fixed effect is tested using an ANOVA table and every test involves a model comparison it involves a comparison between a, a full model which contains the term and then a reduced model which lacks it but may include other terms <coughs> so the log likelihood ratio test is used for data that uh, is not normally distributed, but then also allows you, nevertheless, to compare the fits of two models and thus test for um, effects, nevertheless. And this is the basis for the tests that we'll use when we uh, <coughs> use the general generalized linear models method next week. <coughs> So as long as you have data that represent an independent <coughs> sample and you're interested in comparing a reduced model to a full model, you can use the log likelihood ratio test. It doesn't matter what kind of probability of distribution your data has. The results are approximate, but um, with sufficient sample size, your approximation can be very good. So the formula for the generalized or uh, the log likelihood ratio test is, is this. So again, it's a ratio of likelihoods, and it's a, the natural log of the ratio of likelihoods. And again, it's the likelihood of the full model given the data over the likelihood of the reduced model given the data. And uh, <clears throat> the, the statistic that's calculated is something called G, and so uh, I'm going to refer to that as the log likelihood ratio statistic. And um, if the, uh, usually the way that this is used is that the reduced model is a null hypothesis and the full model is the alternative hypothesis for a test of a specific term. And if the null hypothesis is correct, then G has an approximate chi-squared distribution. And the degrees of freedom of that chi-squared distribution are the difference between the, the, the full model and the reduced model and the number of parameters they can. So once again, it can be used with any data whatsoever, whatever the probability distribution. And so it's a very uh, uh, useful and famous test. So I'm going to apply the log likelihood ratio test to the um, 
WASP data that I already covered. So here again is the um, cabbage white butterfly and the parasitic wasp. And I carried out a series of trials in order to determine whether individual wasps could distinguish the, the mated from the unmated female butterflies. And they found that <clears throat> they obtained 23 successes out of 32 trials. We already estimated the maximum likely estimate of the proportion, which was um, 0.72. But here, uh, we're going to carry out a standard hypothesis test. The null hypothesis in a case like this is uh, always you know, it's a coin toss. Wasps cannot tell the difference between mated and unmated cabbage white butterflies. And that specifies uh, a proportion of 0.5. In other words, it's just the wasp is completely blind. And if they end up on a mated butterfly, they're lucky, and otherwise they're unlucky. And uh, the alternative hypothesis is <clears throat> uh, that the wasp prefer one type of female over the other. So conventionally, it's a two-sided test that you don't necessarily expect or have a, a, a firm biological reason for thinking that if they had a preference, it would necessarily be for the, the mated female. Although, with natural selection at work, you'd, you'd think that, that, would be expect, that that would be the expected outcome. So anyway, we're going to call this the reduced model and the full model. And again, it's just like the ANOVA method that we used before, this one this model has a, a, a term in it which is missing from this one. This is essentially the effect of treatment. <clears throat> and so to fit the full model, to calculate the likelihood of the full model, we calculate the likelihood of, the, um, of P when it is um, fixed at the maximum likelihood estimate. Okay, so there's the general formula again, full model, reduced model, given the data. And the data are 23 out of 32. And uh, so the, um, the likelihood of the full model is essentially the likelihood that P equals 0.72, which is the maximum likelihood estimate. That's the best we can do, given the data that we have. And the null model is that P is 0.5. So it's not estimated from the data at all. It's set by the null hypothesis. And so there's one parameter difference between the numerator and the denominator. In the numerator, we're estimating P, and in the denominator, it's fixed. It's not taken from the data at all. And so this G statistic then would, under the null hypothesis, have a chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom. So I plugged the... Uh, uh, the data into the standard formula and came up with the two likelihoods, the likelihood of 0.72 and the likelihood of 0.5. Both of them came from our likelihood curve. Took the ratio, took the log, multiplied by 2, and uh, degrees of freedom are 1. The chi-square significance value is 3.841. The result for the calculation was um, 6.336, which is greater than 3.841, so we reject the null hypothesis. <clears throat> So when you uh, took um, introductory stats and you did a chi-square goodness of fit test, uh, you probably learned the you know observed minus expected squared all over expected summed, and then you calculate chi-square statistic. You might have been taught a second way of doing this called the G test, another method for uh, calculating a goodness of fit, and it is exactly this. It's the log logarithmic version. That's a very simple um, application that most stats books will um, show you how to calculate. And uh, oops, <clears throat> one point nine two is half of three point eight four one. Do you remember the yeah. drop in <laughs> one point nine two, and and that's where the two comes from. And so that's why. Uh, a 95%, approximately 95% confidence interval comes from all values within um, 3.841 divided by 2 of the maximum likelihood value. So that's where the logic is for the likelihood based 95% confidence interval. <clears throat> I just wanted to add a little bit of biology, and because you, you might be wondering, how does this wasp 
actually tell the difference between a mated and an unmated female butterfly. And it turns out it's the guy's fault. So, so when um, butterflies mate, uh, males deposit benzyl cyanide on the females. You know, and, and that has the effect of making them less attractive to other males. So that it reduces the probability that the female will remate. So that's a pretty common um, method. Chemical um, anti-aphrodisiacs are pretty common in the insect world. It happens all the time, don't worry. <laughs> in, in the insect world. And, uh, uh, and, and the wasp, that's what the wasps use to tell uh, which butterflies made it and which butterflies are made it. They can detect benzyl cyanide. That's just so evil, I thought I would pass that along to you. <laughs> Like a cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> so another area, yeah, this might be out of the uh, you know the normal range of publications that you read, but in my lab we had to learn how to do uh, uh, QTL mapping, and uh, I discovered that it's just uh, an application of a log log integration test. So um, when uh, when people do disease mapping, the way it works is you have, uh, you know, let's say two groups of individuals, healthy and diseased. And in this case, the disease was um, schizoaffective disorder. And uh, you have a series of markers, um, putatively neutral markers, all across the human genome. And then the application of the method basically amounts to, you know, go to the first marker on chromosome one and then um, calculate the likelihood of two models. The full model is that the genotype frequencies differ at that marker between healthy and diseased individuals. If that's true, then there's a mutation nearby. The null hypothesis, the reduced model, is that um, that the frequency of healthy and diseased individuals is the uh, have the same healthy and diseased individuals have the same genotype frequency. So there's no association between genotypes. And so essentially, what you amount, what you what you do is you do a a comparison of the goodness of fit essentially of the full model and of the reduced model at this marker, and then uh, you take the ratio of those two, and then you take the log of it. And that's what a LOD score is. If you've ever heard about LOD score in QTL mapping or disease mapping in general. And for some reason, the geneticists take log base 10 instead of log base 2, log base e. So they take the, the log base 10 instead of the instead of the uh, natural log, and they don't multiply by 2. So it's on a slightly different scale, but it is nevertheless a log likelihood ratio, and there's just a you know constant that would make it a chi-square distributed value if you converted it to two times the natural log. And then you just repeat this all the way down the genome. And you get a profile that looks like this. And then, you know, if your log likelihood ratio exceeds a certain value, a certain threshold, you say, this is significant. There's a there's a mutation. And there is a mutation on chromosome 1 for schizoaffective disorder in humans. So that's just, again, an application of likelihood, one that maybe you don't use a lot, but maybe now at least you know how disease mapping is done using you know, nothing that's particularly out of your reach. So that's my likelihood lecture. And we're going to um, apply this approach, the brute force approach, where we you know, tell R to test, uh, to measure the log likelihood of an entire range of possible values for your parameter to produce them a lot like a hit function, and from that we're going to get approximately 95% common zero. Um, in the meantime, uh, there's another reading on the web page for next week's discussion. So it's all about false discovery rate, and uh, the topic of Bonferroni correction was mentioned um, already. So it's again, the topic is how you um, yeah, how you how you carry out multiple testing basically when you're when you're doing test after test after test. How do you do it? There's a method called false discovery rate uh, controlling, and that's what we're going to read about. <laughs>
and I have already two presenters, and uh, Fiona's already stepped forward, and so I'm looking for one moderator if anyone is interested in doing this next week. Okay, any questions? Thank you.